The following video is for entertainment purposes only. The scenarios presented within have been heavily edited and are neither complete nor meant to act as or in lieu of actual flight instruction. Consult a certified flight instructor for more information. A challenging landing in gusty conditions and icing at night, plus two venues that couldn't be more different. It's another episode of Life in the Fast Lane. I'm John Weiswasser, pilot and drummer for Eagle Mania. Follow me as I explore the practical use of general aviation while I travel the country with the world's greatest tribute to the Eagles. This is Life in the Fast Lane. This episode is about a pair of Eagle Mania shows, the first in Rochester, New Hampshire at the Rochester Opera House on a Friday night with a 5 p.m. sound check, followed the next day by a show at the Rivers Casino in Schenectady, New York with a 5 p.m. sound check, but an 8 p.m. show of only 90 minutes. Using Four Flight's trip planner, the Rochester Opera House was best served by Sanford Regional Airport, which was about 25 minutes away. The Rivers Casino was only five minutes from Schenectady Airport, and I called and confirmed that they had after-hours access. The plan was to launch Friday afternoon from Caldwell for Sanford, do the show, then fly from Sanford to Schenectady on Saturday. If the weather was good, then fly from Schenectady to Caldwell after the show, assuming we didn't finish up too late. METARS, the morning of the first leg, yielded very gusty winds out of the north, all due to a strong front that had passed through the evening before. Towards Sanford, those winds seemed to diminish some. Those winds were forecast to die down over the course of the day, with Portland, Maine forecasting winds of 340 at 12 gusting to 20 by the time of my arrival. Fortunately, Sanford has a runway 32, which was pretty much aligned with those winds. You can see the tight isobars behind the cold front that were responsible for all this. The SIPFIP showed the possibility of light icing at the lower altitudes, and not surprisingly, there was forecasted moderate turbulence at the lower altitudes as well, and this was all depicted nicely in the graphical air mets. There were a couple relevant pilot reports. The first was for some light rime ice at 6,500 feet. Another was for low-level wind shear on approach into Bedford, Massachusetts. The routing was fairly typical for travel in this direction at flight level 210, which is what I filed for. So I went ahead and departed out of Caldwell at 1230 with Ken on board. The departure was pretty much routine. The audio on some parts of the flights of this episode kind of got screwed up. The patch cable had disconnected from itself just enough to lose a signal. Unfortunately, I didn't notice that until after takeoff and in the case of the return leg until I got home and watched the video. Fortunately, all the salient parts of the flight were captured, and I've added that check to the video checklist pre-flight and have secured the cable so that shouldn't happen again. So please, please, please excuse the in and out with the cockpit audio. Okay, over to departure 9 Delta. At our flight level, our file altitude of flight level 210. Change to our routing, which is a little more direct. I just want to make note. Uh, yeah, this wind. 20.6 to before change Which is yielding that ground speed. Very nice. Should get us on the ground. Uh, Sanford. 31 minutes. Right over Boston. Yeah. 929 Delta Alpha to center maintain 11000. One one thousand nine Delta Alpha. Radio nine two nine Delta Alpha Boston Approach. Show more heading zero three zero to maintain five thousand. Okay, zero three zero down to five thousand nine Delta Alpha, and we're requesting the RNAV to three two at nine uh, for nine Delta. Alpha. And we're nine Delta Alpha. Roger. When able to direct Army. Direct Army nine Delta. Alpha. Pretty nine two nine Delta Alpha. Portland Approach. Portland two nine or nine or six. Cross Army out about two thousand. Clear to RNAV runway three two Sanford. Okay, uh, Army at or above 2,000, cleared for the approach, 9 Delta Alpha. I'm picking up a little ice. We're intercepting, uh, and it's an LNAV plus V. Wind 
929 or 0. Yeah, Meridian 929 Delta Alpha, there's no traffic observed between you and the Stanford Airport. Change to advisory frequency is approved. Again, you can cancel the IFR this frequency in the air on the ground 121.725. Okay, we'll go ahead and cancel with you now and uh, over to uh, advisories 9 Delta Alpha. Right, Meridian 9 Delta Alpha, the IFR cancellation is received. Squawk VFR frequency change approved. You have a great day. Okay, VFR, and uh, hope you feel better, 9 Delta Alpha. Hey, thanks, I appreciate that. Wind three four zero at one four peak gust two seven. Sanford traffic Meridian is on an eight mile straight in final three two at Sanford. Anyone else in the pattern? God paths coming alive. So for the sake of brevity, I'm just going to cut to the interesting parts of this approach and landing. You'll see the angles jump around a little bit. I decided not to just do that whole fast forward routine. Okay. Manual, manual, lights, flaps, three green. Oh, wind shear. Oh, that. Speed just dropped 10 knots. This was a challenging approach in gusty conditions. The wind was generally right down the runway, but there were occasional gusts that came from 30 degrees either side, I'd say. You'll notice that when the nose wheel touched, the airplane wanted to veer to the left, a known issue with the Malibu series. It's easy to deal with if you can catch it early and don't overcorrect. And here you can see it veering to the left, just a little bit, but enough to make it a little bit tricky. <laughs> Looking amazing. Oh. I mean, it was amazing how quickly it stopped. Yeah. Right? That wind shear was... was... Insane. Insane. <laughs> Holy crap. All right. If I were a drinker, I'd go can get I, drunk I, right now. Can I breathe now? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Holy fuck. <laughs> <laughs> So many of the theaters we play at have an interesting story, and the Rochester Opera House was no exception. Anthony E. Jark is the executive producer and manager. This is a facility that was built in 1908 by George Gilman Adams. It was one of seven rooms that he built uh, in New England, all of which have burned with the exception of this one. Wow. He was a Rochester native, high school education, but he was a genius. He uh, put together this room with a movable floor that goes up and down. It's the last one of its kind in the country, as far as we know. There's some modern theaters, you know, that have floors and stages that move, but none like this that actually has the capability of, uh, of lowering to a flat position and we remove the chairs right. and we have a big dance floor. We've had wrestling in here, we've got basketball games, um, wow. get big dances, weddings, all sorts of things that we can do in here. Wow. You know, uh, so it's basically, you just come with a power source. This one's electric, it's a small two and a half horsepower motor and that turns a series of belts which calibrates everything up and it drives here, these buddy. bold gears that in turn turn right. these screws yeah, yeah. and the screws basically have a nut on them and uh -huh. uh, as the screw turns it I pulls see. the nut so up and like down and it raises and lowers it. It's like a jack screw. Exactly. That's all hinged right. and then walk this way with me here right. and you'll see the, the floor goes sort of up the wall but right. the thing is the, the wall doesn't contour with the floor. Right. There's space between the floor and the wall Right. and if you come all the way back how bizarre. You can see that the doors, get a shot of the doors, right, I love so the, this. The being John Malkovich door. Yeah, the, door, the doors go down to where the actual floor is. So this is, this, they raise the room up when there's a show. And then the rest of the time, I guess it could be a flat surface if you want right. to play basketball. Uh about uh, Rochester, New Hampshire? About 30,000 people, uh -huh. you know, it's uh, in the middle of nowhere, but sort of the center of everything. It's, uh, we're not far from Portland, Boston's just down the road. Uh, right. We got the beaches and the ocean about a half hour away. And White Mountains are about an hour and a half, right. so uh, we're, we're really kind of centrally located. Great little town, really kind of up and coming. Right. Blue collar town now, the downtown's going through some tough times, but uh, more and more stuff is being built here. And, right. And basically what we're trying to do here at the Opera House is 
continue the, the, the arts. Great bands right. like Eagle Mania, a lot of theater. And the more that we can do that, the more people we're bringing in, the more people that we can hire, both actors, artists, designers, sound engineers, technicians, uh -huh. costumers. And they're starting to take, you know, apartments downtown. This really is the focal point. I mean, you know, a lot of times, uh, you know, I used to see traffic leaving Rochester, but on the highway, you know, right. going to Portsmouth or some other bigger towns right. for a night out, but we've really been able to sort of reverse some of that traffic and have people stay in town. Oh, that's great. Yeah. With the enthusiastic crowd of Rochester, we got an interesting request. Just be like, hey, uh, Liz out there in the balcony, this next song's for you from the decorated that. veteran who loves you. How bad did he fuck up? Bad. Yeah. Cheating. Bad. Bad. Got caught. So, oh, really? Yeah. So we'll, we'll dedicate Get Over It. <laughs> oh God, I'll lose my job, he'll right, kill me. The bright, right? Yeah, right. I kind of need that to happen. Yeah. Classical solo? Yeah. You're going to do some classical, you're going to do some Bach yeah. solo? Yeah, I'll keep that in mind. All right. Everybody spends intermission doing something different. Dr. Gector, <laughs> he's actually reading a book at intermission keeps on Eric Clapton. Keeps my mind off of... Uh, it's just amazing. Where do you draw from primarily? Um, you know, Dover, Summersworth. Uh, we, we don't really get folks what we call over the bridge, which uh -huh. is Portsmouth area, but we're getting them <laughs> north, Ossipee. Uh, main areas, Barrington and all of that. So we, we, we were drawing from about 75 miles, I think. Wow. And with that, we wrapped up a very typical Eagle Mania night at one of our regular venues. <laughs> After a night's stay at the local inn, the next morning brought good VFR in the Northeast, and conditions were forecasted to stay that way throughout the day and into the night. The icing and turbulence forecast offered nothing, so I went ahead and filed direct at 16,000 feet to see what they would give me. And Sanford traffic operating in is taken 3-2, going to be departing to the uh, west at Sanford. Sanford traffic, 19601, taxiway E, crossing runway 25 to get to 3-2. That high pitch hum, that's what happens when the GoPro audio cable partially disconnects itself. I'll get rid of that and forward to the landing as really there was nothing unusual or challenging about this flight. So these two shows couldn't be more of a contrast in terms of venues. From all the history, vibe, intimacy, and warmth of going to a small New England town and packing their 100-year-old unique theater, to going to a somewhat depressed urban area, also in the Northeast, and playing their modern casino, which had the vibe of, well, a casino, the common denominator becomes the music and how much our fans enjoy it. We've done casinos before, and early on, we would play as a sideshow on the main floor while people dump money in the slots. Now, we only play larger rooms, which are usually ticketed. But it is still somewhat jarring to go from a one-of-a-kind century-old theater to a large conference room.
90 minute set, um, kind of a hit and run type of deal, nice crowd. Um, it's always different in a place like this because this is like a flat floor, it's never really a theater setting. So, you know, it's cool, it's going to be great, you know. I like these, especially the second night of a run because it's just, um, the band's nice and tight from the night before. We're, you know, we're tight, but we're loose. We're ready to, to do it, you know? It's going to be fun. It's going to be a lot of fun. That guy here <laughs> is this guy here. And while it's hard to believe that that guy with those glasses and the uh, drug rug turns into that could guy. turn into this guy, just give it about, what, five hours? Five hours and or so. It'll be a miracle takes place. Correct. I'm training Joe to stay away from me on stage. <laughs> He's so hot on me, Charlie. So who would have guessed that this guy here is this guy here. is that guy there. I did this with Ken. Like, look at that guy here is this guy there. I have to dress like this, otherwise, otherwise you're mobs, right. right? People just won't leave you alone, right? Yep. Fortunately, the level of production in this case, specifically the sound and lighting and the size of the stage, were top notch. And most importantly, they packed the room. By the time we hit the stage, there was standing room only in the back, and the front was lined with people who were clearly digging the music. As soon as we were done with the meet and greet, I started briefing for a night flight home. All the stations between Schenectady and Caldwell were VFR, with Schenectady reporting clear skies, although that clearly changed by the time I got there 45 minutes later. The TAFs for a 10.30 departure were also VFR. The SIPFIP called for the possibility of trace icing in the lower altitudes, which I discounted because all of the stations along my route were reporting clear skies. Forecasted turbulence was none. What did catch my eye was a recent pilot report from a Hawker jet of light to moderate rime ice in the descent from 12 to 10,000 feet. I'll take a pie rep any day over a forecast, especially one like this. So I went ahead and filed the expected routing at 10,000 feet. I knew that I could descend as low as 6,000 feet, which was the MEA for the route, to get below the freezing level and out of the ice if I needed to. Zero, ceiling 7,500, overcast, temperature 0 Celsius, dew point minus 1, 0, altimeter 3, 0, 1, 1. Nordum, runway 4, Pappy, out of service, runway 2, 2, Pappy. No longer with clear skies, I knew what to expect en route. I gathered my clearance as filed and launched. Anyone with the pattern at uh, Schenectady? Schenectady traffic, uh, Meridian is taking 2-2, departing southwest, southeast uh, at uh, Schenectady. Departure, good evening, Meridian 99, Delta Alpha is 1.2, climbing 4,000, runway heading. Meridian 99, Delta Alpha, Meridian departure rate, right. correction, uh, ident, climb and maintain 1,0,000. 1,0,000 uh, and identing 9, Delta Alpha. Meridian 9, Delta Alpha, your radar contact, mile and a half southwest of Schenectady Airport, Albany altimeter 3011. Are you familiar with the uh, Agnes intersection? Uh, affirmative. Meridian 9 Delta Alpha, Roger, clear direct Agnes, join Victor 489. Okay, direct Agnes, join 9 Delta Alpha. Oh, we just punched through a layer at uh, 7,500 and picked up a little bit of mixed, mixed icing. And uh, it looks like we're between layers right now, though. 
not sure. We have the prop install heat on. Eye on the wings. Our bailout would be if it got real bad, we'd just descend. Some of this audio is missing due to the cable issue. Once I started picking up ice, I gave a PIREP for it, and the controller referenced the PIREP I came across during the briefing from the Hawker, which was reported in the area that I was at that moment. Roger that. Uh, let me know if you need help. Meridian 9 Delta Alpha be advised. Uh, over the Agnes intersection a little over an hour ago, I had a report of a light to moderate rime ice, maybe between 10 and 12. Are you in any uh, clouds of precip at this time? I of course responded in the affirmative and advised that we didn't need an altitude change at this time. Even though it looks worse in the video, the reality was that it was just traced to light icing and the boots really had no effect on it. Not long afterwards, we were descended progressively down to 5,000 feet, and by then, the ice had completely melted off. I was handed off to New York Approach and I asked for and was given the RNAV to Tutu at Caldwell for an uneventful night landing. Next time on Life in the Fast Lane. Some nice VFR cross country to the Midwest, followed by a challenging approach in low IFR. To go. And a peek into how it gets done, the Dan Seath episode. It's another episode of Life in the Fast Lane. <laughs>